<laughs> we can introduce each other first. Thank you. Well, I suppose Nima hardly needs an introduction since everybody here knows him. But he's going to talk about Grasmani and his polytopes. Polytope Are you going to say it too now? Huh? Uh, no, no, I'm not. No, you, you, you just said it. Uh, thanks very much for the. Uh, uh, opportunity to uh, talk here. Um, really, I have one one real goal in this talk. Um, so this is not a uh, this is not a completely understood subject uh, by far, and um, uh, really part of the motivation of this talk is just introduce uh, um, some of the things that have been going on in uh, in the past number of years in uh, in our understanding of uh, quantum field theory. Uh, which involve a host of new and very interesting mathematical structures. Uh, I want to tell some of the mathematicians about these mathematical structures because uh, um, I and many of my uh, colleagues um, find ourselves continually running into papers by people in this building, <laughs> as well as others from the 1980s and the 1990s, talking about exactly the same sorts of things. The pictures are exactly the same. The words are very similar. Uh, the topics are very similar. And, uh, and we continue to feel there must be something that we can learn um, from this literature, but uh, have frustratingly not been able to do it ourselves. So uh, perhaps we can, uh, uh, but perhaps I hope this, this begins a dialogue with whoever is uh, uh, interested. So uh, maybe I can preface uh, uh, as, a, as a zeroth order statement. Um, roughly speaking, 20 years ago, um, uh, we started realizing that uh, quantum field theories did really extraordinary things um, in certain regimes where we didn't know otherwise what to expect when the coupling constant became strong. And, um, uh, and maybe the most spectacular things that quantum field theories do when the couplings become strong is they turn into theories of quantum gravity in one higher dimension. So they can do really spectacular things. Uh, Somewhat more surprisingly, somewhat surprisingly, um, it's also become clear, though, that, that there's some remarkable structures sitting in quantum field theory even when the coupling is weak, even in the regime where, in principle, Feynman and his friends 60 years ago taught us how to think about things. Okay? There are now strong reasons to suspect that, uh, that while what they told us is certainly correct, uh, it's far from a complete picture of the physics. And there might be a deeper picture of the, of, of the physics um, where uh, the two notions that are sort of hardwired into the standard approach, the notions of, uh, of uh, quantum mechanical evolution through space-time, are not present, but other mathematical structures are present who, that, that, that we're starting to uh, understand, and which involve Grassmannian's polytopes, motives, theory of polylogs, and all of these sorts of uh, uh, wonderful things. Okay. Now, uh, this is roughly speaking, I won't go through who did what, when, where, uh, but this is, roughly speaking, the entire group of people in the world who's working on this subject. So it's not a very big group, um, but, uh, but, uh, <laughs> uh, but, um, uh, but something I will uh, point out is that it, it, it has brought together people who work on traditionally very, very different parts of uh, physics. Um, people, the people in this column are, are people who spent most, most of their lives doing uh, 
hardcore calculations for scattering processes that are relevant for understanding what happens at uh, colliders like Fermilab or the LHC. Not, mind you, to do the calculation for what we normally think of the, as the exciting part, which is the production of new particles that will end up in the New York Times, but to be able to extract that information, you have to understand to exquisite precision what happens with ordinary normal physics, which is dominated by the collision of when you collide protons together, what, what dominates the physics is the collision of quarks and gluons inside the proton, and what comes out are other quarks and gluons. And you have to understand those processes incredibly well in order to be able to extract as a signal on top of that, the uh, little new thing which will, which, will end up in, uh, which will end up in the paper. And the sort of remarkable thing is that in this, in principle, grungy part of, of the physics, just computing all these backgrounds, there's something really remarkable uh, uh, waiting to be uncovered. So anyway, that's the people in this column. There are string theorists, um, uh, twister theorists, as well as, uh, and that was the ugly duckling in uh, theoretical physics for a long time, okay? But they're, they're uh, solidly in the fold <laughs> in this story now, uh, as, well as, uh, um, as well as people who spent a long time thinking about integrable systems, uh, spin chains, one plus one dimensional quantum field theories, and so on. So there, there's, something, there's something interesting going on inexorably drawing these uh, rather disparate fields together. Okay. And I won't go through my relationship to all the names here, because that'll mean even less to this audience than it normally does. So, <laughs> all right. So uh, let me quickly go through the uh, uh, motivations. There are a variety of uh, motivations for thinking about this problem. So the problem broadly we're interested in is the scattering of massless particles in gauge theories. Okay? Uh, the scattering of gluons, a bunch of gluons come in, they scatter, and, a, and, and then a bunch of gluons go out. Um, uh, these, it's a quantum mechanical theory, so what you calculate are the amplitudes for, um, for a particular configuration of gluons in and uh, gluons out. Um, and uh, that's justification by itself for most uh, practicing uh, particle physics. That's our, that's our bread and butter observable. We measure and calculate, uh, we calculate and measure scattering amplitudes in uh, high energy uh, physics experiments. There are deeper reasons for caring about this observable because when you turn on gravity, it turns out that observables like this, like the scattering matrix, are the only observables that you're allowed to talk about. And much more local observables are not precisely what well defined. So that's, that's what I would, would have talked about here if I had more time. Uh, but, so I, but so I assure you that there is some, there is some deeper reason for caring about the, the, uh, uh, the scattering amplitudes having to do with uh, uh, quantum gravity. But let me immediately talk about the practical reason for doing it. So let's say you want to uh, calculate um, uh, the amplitude for two gluons coming in and producing four gluons uh, going out. Uh, Feynman became famous basically by calculating process of the two particles in, to, uh, two particles going out, like an electron and a photon in, an electron and a photon out. Um, but it just turns out that, uh, and people first started doing these calculations not because they were masochistic, but because they were really necessary for, uh, for, for, for backgrounds at the Hadron Colliders. Okay, so you really need to know this one. For example, uh, this process uh, happens, depending on how you think about it, it happens hundreds of thousands of times a second at the, at the LHC, uh, and is one of the dominant backgrounds to discover supersymmetry, uh, which happens roughly once a minute. Okay, so you have to figure out how to understand this so well that you, that you can uh, dig out the once a minute processes over this uh, once every uh, 100,000 times a second sort of process. Okay, so you open up the uh, textbooks. Um, uh, uh, following Feynman, you've got to draw Feynman diagrams, all the possible Feynman diagrams for this process, which are made out of putting three and four point vertex vertices together. So it turns out that there's 220 diagrams, depending on how you count them, tens or 100,000 terms in the expansion of this, this guy. Okay? Now, remember, Feynman diagrams are giving you a picture. This is what they did. This was their point. They're giving you a picture for what happened as a, as, a, as a process of quantum mechanical evolution through space-time. So they make these two things manifest, the fact that theory is quantum mechanical and the fact that theory is local. But, but it does this here at the expense of having 220 diagrams, hundreds of thousands of terms. Now, you might just say that's just life. The process is complicated, the answer is complicated. But that's not what ended up happening. We'll talk about this notation a little later, but uh, people discovered um, that the final answers, when you added up all these diagrams, were vastly simpler than any of the intermediate steps. Okay? Uh, 
So as a function, so if there's if there's uh, these six particles in total, two in, four out, uh, the physics depends also on the helicities of these particles. So the gluons have spin one. They move at the speed of light. So the only quantity you can associate with their spin is a spin either in their direction of motion or opposite to their uh, just the spin in the direction of motion called helicity. So they're they're labeled by pluses and minuses. But anyway, for, for the particular configuration where two of them are minus and the rest of them are plus, uh, the, the entire answer is just a single term. All of those uh, incredibly complicated things add up to a single term. In fact, more generally, if any two of them are negative and the rest of them are plus, it's just this incredibly simple single term. Okay? So that already is an indication there's something wrong with Feynman diagrams. And what is it that makes them so complicated? What is it that makes that obscures the simplicity of the answer? <coughs> and the point is not some uh, is not some technicality. Uh, it's really hardwired into the point in life of, of this way of thinking about the physics. Uh, it's our insistence on describing the physics in a way that's manifestly local and manifestly unitary. Okay? So where, where we make both space-time and quantum mechanics as manifest as possible. I just want to sketch this this argument. Uh, just, just so you see how directly uh, and what, 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 what the culprit is. Uh, so uh, uh, the photon or a gluon, as I mentioned, is a particle of spin one. So it can have it, it has two physical states. If you specify its direction of motion, its two physical states are labeled by their helicity. The spin is either a plus or a minus in the direction of motion. Okay. Said in a more fancy way, that's a consequence of unitarity uh, and and uh, uh, Poincaré invariance, as Wigner proved. Uh, unitary representations of the Poincaré group are labeled by helicity. So that's the fancier way of saying what's also obvious physically, that you only have two helicities. All right, so that's where unitarity comes in. Now, now we've got to talk about locality. And, it, and in order to describe the interactions of this particle in a way that's local, we have to assemble all of these guys into a field, which, uh, I mean, this guy is labeled by momentum and a helicity. But we have to assemble all of these, uh, all of these particles fundamentally into a field that depends on a space-time point x. And then we write down interactions between these fields in a way that's local in x. And that's, that guarantees that the underlying particles interact in a local way. So this is, this is why quantum field theory uh, has its name. Okay? It's, it's, it, it's, uh, uh, there's quantum and field. The quantum is there because we're talking about, uh, uh, well, we're dealing with things in a unitary way, but the fields come in in order to describe the physics in a local manner. But the difficulty begins because if we're going to describe it with a field, it has to be a vector field. Okay? So it has to have a Lorentz index. There are four of these components, whereas there's only two physical uh, helicities of the particle. If you, if you imagine writing a, a solution of uh, Maxwell's equations, let's say, at, uh, or the, uh, the linearized theory, uh, it will involve a polarization vector times, times a plane wave. And again, there's four components to that polarization vector, not two. Two is the number of physical degrees of freedom. But in order to describe it using a field, we have four degrees of freedom flying around. Now, there's various things you can try to do to reduce the number of degrees of freedom to the correct physical number. You can, for example, demand that that polarization vector is orthogonal uh, with the Minkowski metric to the momentum itself. That's one constraint. So we have three degrees of freedom. But then you're really stuck. Uh, because there's simply no Lorentz invariant way, no Lorentz invariant way of picking out the two helicities uh, uh, by putting any kind of Lorentz invariant constraint on, on this guy. The problem is if you have epsilon, epsilon plus anything proportional to the momentum also satisfies that, that constraint because p dot p is equal to zero since we have a massless particle. So this is the first time we encounter a novelty in our, in our attempt to describe things in a way that's manifestly unitary and local. We're forced to introduce equivalence classes to describe exactly the same object. The object is described not uniquely by this uh, field a mu or that polarization vector, but we have to introduce equivalence classes which differ by something uh, that shifts the polarization vector by something proportional to the momentum, which back in position space is the celebrated gauge invariance of the theory. You see the gauge invariance is more commonly, is more correctly referred to as a gauge redundancy because we have to declare that that configuration and that configuration are the same, that they give us the same physics. There isn't an actually, a, there is no actual symmetry here. The gauge symmetry is all in our head. It's, it's simply our way of describing this physics in a way that's manifestly local. 
and there may be other ways. Okay? And that's, that's part of the theme here, is that this gauge redundancy brings a very heavy cost. You have to uh, have, throughout the calculation, spread around all of these unphysical <laughs> redundant degrees of freedom that cancel in some complicated way when you add everything up to get the final answer. So that's one thing that we're going to imagine is a way of doing it which doesn't make use of either the fields, the, the space-time locality, no gauge symmetry either, but just directly write down the answer. All right, I won't go through that, that motivation. But uh, I will say that all of this structure has been sitting under our noses for a long time. Um, that, uh, that beginning with these, these uh, great simplicities that, that I just showed you some examples of, in the last 20 years, there's been more and more and more and more evidence that there is something really, uh, that there's a new formulation of uh, quantum field theory which won't have the same words associated with it. Okay? it in particular, it won't have the inside of the space time playing such a crucial role. And there are many reasons to suspect or want such a thing because for other reasons, we, for gravitational reasons, we suspect the inside of the space time doesn't exist anyway. And uh, the, the last number of years have seen, uh, I think, uh, uh, lots of progress to, to seeing what this, this new, new picture is, which, as I mentioned, combines ideas from string theory, the ADS-CFT correspondence, twister theory, integrable systems, as well as a host of new structures in algebraic geometry. Uh, and that's what I want to tell you about in the rest of the talk. All right. So let me uh, quickly just tell you what the cast of characters is. Okay, so this is just going to take a little bit of time. The, the, uh, the details won't be very important, uh, but I just want to but some of the, some of the letters will, uh, will occur again and again. So, um, um, okay. So we are talking about gluon scattering amplitudes. That's the, uh, uh, that's, that's, that's the subject. Uh, if you imagine that the, uh, that the gauge group is SUNC, uh, then we can conven the gluons are in the adjoint representation, so we can conveniently think about them as being labeled by a color and an anti-color. Now, uh, so then, then uh, you, you can imagine drawing all the Feynman diagrams, and then instead of carrying around structure constants everywhere, you can just draw these, uh, these, these little double line pictures that, uh, that, that denote the uh, color gauge structure of the uh, amplitude that you're, you're talking about. Now, we're going to do something else, which is, uh, so we can draw all the Feynman diagrams that we drew before for that two to four process at tree level. They'll all look, look like this. The external uh, states are specified by their momenta as well as their helicity. So each one of these h is a plus one or a minus one. Okay. Then beyond these uh, these tree amplitudes that don't involve any uh, don't don't any don't involve any loops of uh, particles, we can start drawing diagrams with loops. And uh, a very important observation going back to the 70s is that there's a great simplification in the limit as the number of colors goes to infinity. If you send the number of colors to infinity, then, then all, only planar diagrams uh, survive. So we're only drawing planar Feynman diagrams, if you like, drawing all, adding up all the planar diagrams together. Okay? All right, now, now the, the, uh, this will be less relevant to this audience, but uh, I'll just say that, that for a long time it was not quite clear what to talk about at loop level, uh, because, um, because when, when you compute these loop amplitudes, there are famous divergences which appear. Actually, the divergences that appear here are not the very, very famous ones that you hear about involving ultraviolet divergences. These are infrared divergences that have to do with the fact that all these particles are massless. They were encountered even earlier in the discussion of quantum field theory, even before people understood how to deal with the ultraviolet divergences. But anyway, and there's a well-understood way of dealing with them, uh, but it's still relatively annoying to deal with infrared divergent uh, uh, quantities. So uh, I'll, just, I'll just state it here um, that, uh, that uh, there's actually an, a slightly auxiliary object that we're going to talk about. Not the whole amplitude itself, but the integrand that you integrate to get the amplitude. Okay. So because there is a closed loop here, there's an undetermined momentum, which we normally integrate over. We integrate over all the undetermined momenta. And it turns out that in the planar limit, there is, uh, there is a, there is a well-defined integrand. You can put all these diagrams together and put them all under one integral sign. And there is a well-defined integrand. The planarity is very important, uh, is very important for that. But uh, we are interested in the planar limit, so the integrand is well-defined. OK, now, we are going to imagine that all the momenta, 
all the four momenta of the particles are incoming, so momentum conservation is just a statement that all these momenta add up to zero. So now, so far, the object that, we're, that we have is labeled by the momenta, helicities, and the loop order. Okay? So it depends on the various loop momenta. These are the undetermined momentum in the middle of the diagrams that you have to integrate over in order to get the answer. Okay? I should say that the, these are all four-dimensional integrals. They're, 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 it's a four space-time dimension, so you integrate over the four undetermined loop momenta, L0, L1, L2, L3. Okay. And, and I should say that, that well, something that, 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 that we'll see is if you think about this object as a physicist, uh, you would want to integrate these loop momenta on a real contour for L0, L1, L2, L3, real going from minus infinity to infinity. And one of the points is that thought of as an interesting rational function, um, it has other properties that, and other questions that you can ask of it, uh, which will also end up being interesting and, and start making uh, contact with uh, some of the structures that, 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 that I was mentioning before. Okay. But anyway, this is a well-defined rational function. Okay. It's a function of the external momenta and the, uh, 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 the internal loop momenta and the helicities of the particles. Are you using the Minkowski uh, metric? Yes. We're, we're using Minkowski metric everywhere here. All right, now, uh, here are some very basic kinematics that uh, many of you are, are, I'm sure, very familiar with. Um, uh, one of the things that we're going to do uh, more and more of um, in this talk is describe all, especially all the kinematics, in, uh, in as unconstrained a way as we possibly can. Okay? So, that means, whereas we normally think about a, uh, a massless particle as just being specified by a momentum vector with, an, with a zero component and, and a spatial component, and we just say that that squared is equal to the magnitude of that squared, so we describe it in a constrained way, it's useful to describe it in, uh, in terms of variables that are not constrained. So if I take these guys, I can group them into a two by two matrix, like so, uh, just um, uh, dotting them into the uh, Pauli uh, matrices. And, uh, and you'll see that the determinant of this matrix is p0 squared minus p3 squared minus p1 squared minus p2 squared. So the determinant of the matrix is just the, uh, is just the inner product of the momentum with itself. Uh, if the particle is massless, p squared is equal to zero, so this two by two matrix uh, has vanishing determinant. That means that it's rank one. So I can write it as the, as the uh, outer product of two two-dimensional vectors. One of them I'm calling lambda, the other one ca I'm calling lambda tilde. I should say that, uh, uh, at this point, everything that we're going to do is going to be complex. Okay? Uh, all the variables are going to be complex. We're complexifying everything. If this was a real momentum, uh, and uh, if, so if all these momenta were real, then lambda tilde would have to be the complex conjugate of lambda. And the Lorentz group would be SL2C. Here we're complexifying everything here, so the complexified Lorentz group is SL2 cross SL2, with one SL2 acting on lambda and the other SL2 acting on lambda tilde. So the invariants that you can build just take these basic objects and dot them together uh, uh, and, and just contract them with the uh, epsilon symbol. Now, uh, so, so, so now that, that this looks good. I just hand you two completely unconstrained lambda and lambda tilde, and, and you can build out of that a light-like momentum. But there's a little counting problem, right? There's four of these guys that, well, that there should be three of these guys, because there's four of them plus a constraint, but I count four of them still here. So what, what's going on? Well, what's going on is that these guys are not, obviously, are not uh, well-defined. They're only well-defined up to uh, uh, rescaling this and that guy oppositely. So there's still some redundancy in writing it like this. That's an, actually an incredibly useful redundancy, because that's what encodes, that's what, encodes what the helicity of the particle is. Okay? In fact, the amplitudes are really functions of these lambda and lambda tilde variables. Oops, uh, I should, uh, uh, anyway. Maybe I'll just tell you. They're functions of those lambda and lambda tilde variables with some homogeneity when you rescale uh, lambda and lambda tilde by opposite amounts. The, the, if you rescale lambda goes to t lambda, lambda tilde goes to t inverse lambda tilde, then, then the amplitude should pick up a factor t to the negative two times the helicity of the particle. So it's homogeneous with a given weight. And that's actually how you read off what the, uh, what the helicities of the particles are. All right. So, uh, so that's, the, that's the data so far. Let me, uh, uh, let me keep going and talk about uh, one more uh, level of simplicity, that, that, uh, one, one more simplification that, that 
we're, we're going to use. Instead of just talking about the scattering of gluons, we're going to talk about scattering in n equals 4 super Yang mills, the maximally supersymmetric version of this, this theory. And of course, supersymmetry is beautiful from many, many different points of view. Uh, there's, I think, lots of reasons to believe that n equals 4 super Yang mills is like the harmonic oscillator of the 21st century. We really need to understand and solve it every possible way we can. <laughs> Um, but in this context, there's a particularly simple reason, uh, there's, a, there's a particularly good reason for thinking about uh, supersymmetry. And that is that the objects that I was telling you about so far are very discrete. They're labeled with a plus and a minus index for every external particle. If you have n particles, there's two to the n different uh, uh, amplitudes that we're talking about. And it's just much nicer to deal with smooth objects than with these choppy uh, discrete ones. So supersymmetry is a symmetry that adds a whole bunch of other particles in between. So here's a negative helicity gluon, there's a positive helicity gluon, but there are some fermion of negative helicity, fermions of positive helicity, uh, scalars of zero helicity in between. So it adds a lot of extra particles, but it unifies them all in one supermultiplet. And so you can now smoothly go from one guy to the other just by performing supersymmetry transformations. Therefore, instead of labeling the amplitudes by these discrete labels, helicity labels, plus and minus, we can label them by, uh, by eigenstates of some of these uh, supercharges. Um, uh, these, are, these, are, uh, these are some particular linear combination of all these states. Eta just happens to be, sorry, I should put a tilde here, happens to be a Grassmann parameter because this is supersymmetric. But, uh, but uh, it's a particular linear combination of all these helicity states, which, uh, which uh, is an eigenstate of one of the supercharges and on which supersymmetry acts nicely. But the point is that now we have an even simpler object to talk about. There's no discrete labels. There's just a dependence on lambda, lambda tilde, and these Grassmann uh, variables, eta tilde, for all the external particles. Okay, okay and, and the final bit of uh, uh, notation is that if I take this, these are Grassmann parameters. So any function of these Grassmann parameters, there's four of them for every particle. Okay, so there's an eta, a, one, two, three, four. Um, but whatever it is, is some polynomial in these Grassmann parameters. And uh, you can have terms in the polynomial with zero etas, four etas, eight etas, 12 etas, and so on. So we just expand them out in this way. Uh, just k uh, tells us that this is a sector that contains four k eta tildes. And physically, uh, amongst all the amplitudes that are described by this one super amplitude, there is one where in, in the underlying components, k of the gluons have negative helicity, n minus k of them have positive helicity. Okay. The gauge group is SUN and n has been sent to infinity. So uh, I, I sh uh, thank you. I should have said that at, at the very start. Uh, so so all, all we now have are, are the amplitude is labeled by, is labeled by, by the particles. There's, a, uh, there's one, two, three, four, up to n. And uh, the original amplitude had, uh, the, the original amplitude had a label which was, which was a label of the gauge group. So it'd be m a one up to a n, of p one up to p n. But by drawing these pictures, what we've done is just strip off all the group theory factors in a trivial way. So there's something that looks like that m one two up to n. Okay, and then we just sum over all the different possible permutations of these guys. Okay, so so in the end, the fundamental object is just something that depends, has no more color indices at all. It just depends on one, two, up to n. But because the traces are cyclic, this should be a cyclically invariant function of the uh, external variables. Okay. So all information about the gauge group is now, is now gone. We're dealing with uh, completely gauge invariant concepts here. OK. Um, now, it turns out that for very good reasons, uh, when k equals 0 and k equals 1, supersymmetry just is trivially allows you to prove that these amplitudes vanish. Uh, <clears throat> I should also comment that, note that parity interchanges the role of lambda and lambda tilde. So p was lambda, lambda tilde. And parity is the simple uh, symmetry that just interchanges lambda and lambda tilde, uh, which also interchanges k and n minus k. So keep that in mind. Okay? So, so we have a lambda, lambda tilde interchange symmetry, and the k goes to n minus k. <coughs> Uh, interchange symmetry as well. The amplitudes where k equals 2 are called MHV. With k equals 3 are called next to MHV. MHV, for historical reasons, is maximal helicity violating, but it, it, it doesn't matter. It's just a name I will slip into every now and then. All right. All right, so, so, the, so the summary is that we're after a theory which is just going to compute this quantity. Lambda, lambda, tilde, eta, tilde, and L. 
Okay? So there's some well-defined functions. We can compute them normally uh, using Feynman diagrams, which is unitary evolution through space-time. We want to compute them in another way, which gets the answer in some different way. And if we succeed and we really understand uh, deeply uh, how this happens, then we'll be able to read back what the properties are that allowed this thing to have a local interpretation, that allowed it to have a unitary interpretation. But the, this is the whole point, is we don't want to put in locality and unitarity in. If we understand things well, we should see them come out. Okay. So now let me show you what some of these amplitudes uh, actually look like. Um, just as a, as a uh, almost as a sociological statement, um, this is an extremely data-rich subject. It's a funny thing for a physicist to, to talk about data in this way, although it must be very familiar to a mathematicians. Um, uh, it's an incredibly data-rich subject because people have been, of course, computing these scattering amplitudes for 60 years. Um, and so if you're coming along with a new whiz-bang way of computing them, uh, one thing you would better do is you would better be able to reproduce everything which has been computed so far. Of course, hopefully you're also going to uh, compute things that have never been computed before. So how do you know that they're right? Well, of course, uh, the point is that while standard methods like Feynman diagrams are hellishly complicated for actually getting the answer, if someone came along and handed you the answer, it's very simple to check that it's correct. It's very simple to check that it satisfies the usual rules of that it's local and it's unitary, for example. Okay? So there's lots and lots of checks, both lots of existing data that you have to reproduce, as well as lots of checks on the answer if you have a, a putative way of uh, computing something that hasn't been computed before. But really, a lot of the progress in this story um, uh, has been stimulated by technological revolutions, <laughs> which are, in this context, ways of computing the amplitudes that allow you to compute many things that you didn't know how to compute before and gather a lot more data. And, uh, and uh, certainly for the purposes of this talk, um, this activity was stimulated by a paper of uh, Edwards from 2003 um, that, that first made this connection between uh, this very startling connection between uh, amplitudes and Yang-Mills theory and twister space. But it immediately had as a repercussion a variety of concrete com computational tools to actually calculate the simplest amplitudes and calculate a ton more of them than had ever been computed before. And the ones that are the most uh, important for the purposes of this talk and which I think did more than any of them to really uh, to, uh, to, um, uh, to generate the huge amount of data that, that, that ended up being useful, was a recursive method for determining uh, scattering amplitudes going under the name of BCFW recursion. It's Brito, Freddy Cachazo, Bo Feng, who are all uh, members in, in our school at the time, and uh, Edward. Uh, so I'll, I'll give you a sketch of the idea, which sounds in incredibly simple. I'll tell you the one place something not non-trivial is uh, hiding in it. So the idea is you want to compute some amplitude, which is a function of a bunch of momenta. Pick two of the momenta and deform them into the complex plane in a canonical way. Just add something complex to one of them and subtract something complex from the other one to conserve momentum. In terms of these uh, lambda and lambda tilde variables, this is the deformation that you do. So you go from what was a rational function of the lambdas and lambda tildes. Now you just pay attention to its dependence on z, and it's a rational function of z in the uh, complex plane. You're only drawing tree amplitudes here. There's no funny closed loops. So the, the only, uh, you're guaranteed to be getting a rational function here. Now in the complex plane, this thing has a bunch of poles. All the poles have a very well uh, understood physical interpretation. All the poles occur when in the course of drawing or adding up all these Feynman diagrams, some intermediate particle, which we normally and, and uh, uh, whimsically refer to as being virtual, <laughs> actually becomes a real particle and, and actually traverses a very, very long distance in space-time. All singularities in, uh, in uh, amplitudes, actually all singularities, not just the ones in tree diagrams, but in particular the ones in tree diagrams, are associated with virtual particles becoming real. Okay? And if you dial some of the external momenta around, uh, it becomes possible for some of the intermediate channels, the momentum that it has is just the sum of all the momenta coming in. If the sum of all the momenta coming in squares to zero, uh, uh, the intermediate particle can go, can go on shell. That's, that's, uh, that's the jargon for it. The intermediate particle goes on shell. On shell means that the particle isn't virtual, it's real. And when that happens, we understand exactly what the residue is. The residue is just the product of the tree amplitude on the, on, on the left producing that particle, uh, a lower point tree amplitude on the right, and then some <coughs> factor that you strip off 
uh, so that there was a singularity associated with that propagation, you strip that off to compute the residue, so it's just given by the product of the guy on the left and on the right. Okay, so this sounds great. We have a, we have a function of z, uh, which involving n particles, and we know all of its poles as a function of, uh, uh, we know the residues of all those poles if we knew the lower point amplitudes. So a trivial application of Cauchy's theorem would then let you reconstruct the big tree amplitude just by lower point tree amplitude. Okay? Just, uh, there's only one catch in this argument. The catch is that you also have to know the pole at infinity. <laughs> you have to know there is no pole at infinity, for example. And, and uh, that, while that's a very natural statement, it, it, um, that's where all the that's where the non-triviality is, uh, is actually hidden in this argument. If you look at individual Feynman diagrams, there are poles at infinity. And it's a remarkable fact about summing all of them up that the poles at infinity cancel. So, so, uh, and so things, things are well behaved in this argument. Amplitude in terms of lower point points. So now let me give you an example. Uh, so let's go back to the six particle gluon amplitude. And here's a particular co component amplitude uh, where the helicities are alternating, one minus two, 1 plus, 2 minus, and so on. And you don't need to look at this in great detail, but this is what you get from BCFW recursion. Okay? So you see it's still pretty simple. It's just a sum of three terms. So those uh, 220 diagrams, tens of thousands of terms, now in the most general helicity configuration, breaks up into the sum of three terms. And the only thing I want to draw your attention to is the pole structure which occurs here. All of these poles have a good space-time interpretation. In other words, they're good local poles. They correspond to long distance propagation uh, um, in, in, in space time. But these are funny poles that do not have a local space time interpretation. So obvious reasons we call them non-local or spurious poles. Okay? So this is quite striking. There's two striking things here. A, the, the result is wonderfully simple. But B, it's built out of building blocks that don't have a local interpretation. And C, of course, uh, that's already interesting, but even more interesting is that when you add the three of them up, it must be that these non-local poles cancel out and you're just left with the local ones. Okay? So the answer is incredibly simple when expressed in terms of some building blocks that don't care much about locality. But there is some magic that has to happen when you add them together for the end result to be local. Okay? So perhaps this should start getting you a little excited as a mathematician. In fact, uh, another strange thing about this recursion, of course, is that I told you, you can pick this pair of particles. You have to pick some pair of particles to do the recursion. So it's not obvious that you get the same answer when you do it in different ways. Of course, the underlying quantum field theory guarantees that you get the same answer. But simply at the level of the actual rational expressions that you get, it isn't obvious that they're the same. And in fact, they're not the same. Okay? You don't get the same uh, sum, of, sum of terms. So here is, in fact, the identity that would need to be true in order for two different ways of doing this recursion to give you the same answer. Okay? And it's a, it's a, it's a rather re remarkable little six-term identity involving rational functions. These are all rational functions. Okay? It's a six-term identity. Uh, one of the great things, if, if you knew this identity was true, one of the great things about it is it would automatically imply that these non-local poles cancel. Uh, you probably can't see it in detail, but the non-local poles are different on the left-hand side and on the right-hand side. So it's merely knowing that this identity is true <laughs> is enough to guarantee that the answer is actually local. All right, so, so, so this is striking. The, the amplitudes are written in terms of some relatively simple objects. The simple objects are glued together, can be glued together in interesting ways. They satisfy interesting linear relationships between each other, and these linear relationships guarantee, amongst other things, important physical properties like locality. But at higher points, there's more and more complicated identities like this that are needed, and clearly there needs to be some understanding for where these identities, what these objects are, and where these identities are coming from. So the six terms are what you had in red there. Uh, yeah. So there's there's just the, the this plus flipped two more, right. and then this guy plus flip 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 two more. Okay. And if you try to check it by hand, this one you can check by <laughs> hand. Well, I can check by hand with a lot of help, <laughs> but uh, uh, but there are there they're not they're really not non-trivial identities. All right. Now, so far, I think uh, uh, this, this was certainly enough to convince me to, to, to start thinking about this, this, this subject. Um, that, that's the, that it seems that, uh, that standard, good old-fashioned quantum field theory wants to be thought about in some slightly 
or maybe not so slightly different way. Okay? We have to understand wh what these objects are, what's spitting them out, why they satisfy the, 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 these identities, and so on. And the fact that the answers are so incredibly simple compared to what you would expect is the, the underlying motivation. But if you're, if you're skeptical, still skeptical, that, that there has to be a better way of thinking about things, there's one, uh, I think, th this, is the, this is the sort of nail in the coffin, uh, or, the, or the killer argument that there's got to be a better way of thinking about things, which is that the answer has infinitely many symmetries that are completely hidden in the usual uh, way of, um, in the usual presentation. So before telling you about the infinitely, the infinitely many hidden ones, let me tell you about the obviously visible ones. So uh, uh, theories of massless particles uh, are conformally invariant. They're obviously scale invariant, because there's nothing to set the scale. And uh, in all the examples we know, scale invariant theories, um, which are Lorentz invariant, are also fully conformal invariant. So in particular, they have the remarkable symmetry under inversions. Now, the usual way we talk about things are, um, in Lagrangian field theories treats all the symmetries in the conformal group on a rather different footing. Translations, Lorentz uh, transformations, and conformal transformations are each treated uh, as, as, uh, as different generators. As, as uh, you know, the, 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 conformal, uh, the conformal transformations are, are, well, the inversion isn't linear, for example. Okay? So, so we, we, uh, we treat them differently. It's a very good idea. Uh, to use variables that make the symmetries as simple as possible. And, and this is the point in life of, uh, for the purpose of this talk, is a point of life in, in twister space. So twister space is going to be used heavily throughout the rest of this talk, and its point is largely kinematical, so that you're talking about the variables in the simple, the, you're, you're talking about the kinematics in the simplest possible way, in a way that makes the symmetries as manifest as possible. Of course, it's also nice that the, the underlying philosophy is also that uh, instead of talking about points in space-time, you're talking about things that uh, go out to the uh, light rays that pass through space-time and go out to the boundary. So let's say you want to talk about a null ray in space-time. It's just a lightning review of, uh, of twister methods. If you want to talk about a null ray in space-time, then you just write down a linear equation uh, involving these, uh, uh, these uh, two spinners. And it's very easy to check that all the x's that satisfy this equation, any two of them are null separated from each other. So we can group this mu tilde and lambda tilde together into a complex four vector. Of course, if I rescale this equation by any parameter t, uh, I have exactly the same null line. So I should really think about uh, this uh, four vector and this four vector times anything as being equivalent. So, uh, so these null rays in spacetime correspond to points in twister space, which we think about as uh, a point in CP3. And the conformal transformations act beautifully linearly on these guys. They're just SL4 acting on, these, uh, on this four vector. So that's the first part of the equivalence. A null ray in spacetime is a point in spacetime. Uh, a null ray in spacetime is a point in twister space. Now let's say you take two points in twister space. It's extremely easy to see that if you just take this equation for mu1 and lambda1 and mu2 and lambda2, that there's a unique x that's, that, that satisfies both of them which you can solve for. So there's the, the explicit formula for x. There should have been tildes there everywhere, sorry. Uh, and so given any two points in twister space, uh, there's associated with that a point in spacetime. Actually, I could do any two by two linear transformation on those two equations uh, that I like and get the same point. So that means that it's not, just a, it's not a function of w1 and w2, but only the line which is formed by w1 and w2. So that's the second part of the correspondence, basic part of the correspondence. A line in twister space corresponds to a point in spacetime. And uh, then everything about conformal geometry in Minkowski space gets mapped to projective questions in CP3. So for example, if you have two points that are null separated in spacetime, uh, the corresponding lines intersect each other in, in uh, twister space. And the projective geometry is, in many cases, just practically easier to think about <laughs> and, uh, and do, do a geometry with than, uh, than Minkowski geometry. So we have no metric, nothing. It's just, uh, we're just doing projective geometry in CP3. OK, so that's the usual conformal symmetry. Now here's the hidden symmetry. Remember, uh, um, we're, dealing with these, uh, we're, we're, we're dealing with amplitudes, as I mentioned, in this planar limit. In this planar limit, we have that cyclic ordering. So there's a natural ordering, cyclic ordering, to the external particles. So just draw them. Uh, so here's the momentum of the first particle, P1, the second particle, P2, P3, 
P4. If I draw them on a four-dimensional sheet of paper, they'll close into a closed polygon. OK, so, so I can introduce then a new space, x, where the momenta are differences of the coordinates. I draw this polygon whose edges are null lines. Uh, OK, so this is, a, this is a new funny coordinate space. The units in this coordinates of these, of these coordinates are momenta, so they're the inverse of the usual coordinates. We should not, x is not our space, but it's some auxiliary space associated with the momenta, where the momenta are the edges of this null polygon. OK. Now, there was an experimental observation around four years ago um, that the amplitudes are invariant under conformal transformations in this space. Okay. It's a completely bizarre fact, but they're invariant under conformal transformations in this space. And while this wasn't the first way this was understood, uh, it was quickly understood that, uh, uh, for example, for, for tree amplitudes, um, this, this statement is manifest term by term in that BCFW expansion of tree amplitudes that I was telling you about. So those BCFW terms are obviously conformally invariant, because they came, they're obviously conformally invariant, but they turn out to less obviously also be dual conformal invariant. Okay? So they're invariant under both conformal and dual conformal transformations. That gives us a much more vivid feeling for why these objects weren't local. Okay? They're serving two masters. They're, they know about both space-times. They know about the symmetries on, under both space-times. It would have been far too much to expect them to be completely local in one of them, because they don't particularly care about either one. They know about the symmetries of both the original and the dual space-time. Okay. And I stress that this dual conformal symmetry is completely invisible in the usual Lagrangian. Okay. In fact, it's a property, even of the non-supersymmetric theory, appropriately in interpreted, a property of Yang-Mills theory, when the number of colors is large, at tree level, is this, uh, is, this, is this remarkable symmetry. It could have, I suppose, in principle, been discovered in 1955, although <laughs> that would have taken a lots and lots of uh, foresight. But it wasn't discovered until 2006. Okay? So it's another example of something that was sitting under people's noses for, for really a long time. OK. Now, we're again going to use the, the simplest variables to describe uh, this conformal symmetry, so associated with this uh, dual space, we're now going to talk about its associated twister space. Okay. So if you imagine now, uh, this, uh, this is some of the edges of the polygon that I was drawing before. This is a null polygon. Okay. So associated with that point is a line in the associated twister space that's called momentum twister space. This is another, uh, so that point is a line. This point is another line. This point and that point are null separated, so this line and that line intersect at that point. Similarly, that one and that one. So, so associated with the polygon in X space, we have a picture of intersecting lines, one the next, in momentum twister space. Okay? And now, this is the, the sort of final beautiful point about the kinematics. So there's a completely trivial algebraic way of mapping from the lambdas and lambda tildes. If I hand you these momentum twister variables, there's a trivial way of going back and forth just algebraically. Uh, back to lambdas and lambda tildes. And this is really the nicest thing about them, is you can now specify completely unconstrained momentum twister variables. Random, unconstrained momentum twister variables. And they are guaranteed to give you a kinematics which uh, consists of null momenta that add up to zero. So we have completed the project of describing things in the least constrained way possible. I give you totally unconstrained momentum twisters. I use them to define uh, so, so I can go back from that to a, a picture of points in the dual X space that are guaranteed to be null separated from each other, and so therefore to a bunch of momenta that add up to zero. Okay? And so there's a completely algebraic map between, in fact, the Z is a mu and a lambda. This is some super component, so it's a really a super twister, but that doesn't, it's not very important. Uh, but, uh, but, but given the mu and the lambda and an eta, you can construct the lambda is the same. You can construct the lambda tilde by this trivial formula and a bunch of etas, which are guaranteed to satisfy, uh, which are guaranteed to, uh, to, to give you good kinematical data. Okay. So let me give you a, so uh, uh, this is the final important point about um, just kinematics before we start talking about dynamics. Um, so normally, so th there's a completely trivial part of this, and it's very slightly less, less trivial part. So let's first talk about the completely trivial part. If you imagine drawing a, a, a planar loop diagram, here's a planar, uh, here's a planar loop. I would normally imagine that that uh, internal momentum is L, 
Uh, and so this one is L plus P1, L plus P1 plus P2, L plus P1 plus P2 plus P3. Uh, but it's more convenient to use these dual variables. So, so if, I, uh, if I just draw in the, uh, the, if I draw the dual graph uh, to, to what I normally think of as the uh, Feynman diagram, so there's the point x1, so x2 minus x1 is p1, x3 minus x2 is p2, and so on. Uh, the loop momentum variable itself is just integrating over a general point x in this space. So what I was calling before L is just x minus x1, so it looks already much more symmetrical. It's 1 over x minus x1 squared, x minus x2 squared, x minus x3 squared, x minus x, x4 squared. All right, so this is completely trivial. We can write any planar loop diagram as an integral over positions in this dual space. And it'll turn out that, uh, that, that what's going to come out for us much more naturally directly is uh, um, to think about this as an integral not over points in the dual space but over lines in momentum twister space. Okay, so we associate an x with a line in momentum twister space and it's naturally, I mean it's trivial to go back and forth but it's much more naturally presented in this uh, twistorial way. <laughs> okay, so finally uh, these two symmetries, the obvious one and the hidden one, don't commute with each other. And if you just commute them all together, you get an infinite dimensional symmetry algebra. Okay. This, is the, this is a Yangian algebra. It's an infinite dimensional symmetry that's completely invisible in the usual local Lagrangian. And of course, I don't have any time to uh, uh, talk about this, but it, this makes a very striking con uh, connection with integrability, which has shown up in other contexts already in the uh, discussion of n equals 4 super Yang melts. Not the problem of scattering amplitudes, but, uh, but uh, simpler problems about uh, the spectrum of the operators in, 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 in the theory, but anyway. But obviously the, the, these Yangians have come up before, um, uh, but they normally come up in, in the study of simple uh, spin chain sy systems. If you take the famous Heisenberg spin chain, if you have a bunch of a spin and a half particles and they have a local interaction uh, uh, with each other, then this, this problem can be solved in a thousand ways because, it's, because it's, it's integrable. And one of the hallmarks of its integrability is the existence of an infinite tower of charges, non-local charges, that commute with it. Here's the first one of, a, of an infinite set. In this case, the Yangian algebra is the Yangian of SU2. And the Yangian that's uh, showing up in the scattering amplitudes is the Yangian of SL4 slash 4. The slash four is just the extra fermionic pieces. Okay, um, but uh, uh, it's it's a very important physical question. So outstanding, what the heck do spins have to do with the problem of uh, uh, of the scattering of, of gluons? Okay, and we still don't have, despite the fact the symmetries are exactly the same. Many of the techniques for thinking about them are very similar. Beta ansatz has come up. Uh, Yang Yang equations come up. Y systems come up. Still the the set of words that uh, would connect a bunch of spins on a chain to the problem of scattering amplitudes is not there. And I think that's, uh, uh, well, it, it, that's one of the things which is still really missing in this business. All right. Okay, so in my last little bit, uh, I wanna uh, tell you about um, at least some of the pieces of a new formulation. Of course, we don't know the whole, we don't know the whole story. There may be many different kinds of story. But I want to emphasize the things which I, which I think will, uh, which, uh, where there might be the most uh, room for contact with, uh, with uh, uh, ideas in, in, in mathematics uh, that, I, that I advertise in the title with the uh, uh, Grossmannians and polytopes. Okay. And coincidentally, these are also the pictures in which the usual space-time uh, notions are very, very far away. Okay, so they're, all right. So let's go all the way back to the beginning. Um, and what, what we want to do is, uh, is think about some way of getting these amplitudes without talking about evolution through a space time. So, um, uh, so let's go back to the very beginning and think about something as basic as momentum conservation. Okay? Actually, even before getting to momentum conservation, let's just think about the data. Let's even forget, let's just think about the lambdas and the lambda tildes um, uh, in a slightly different geometric way. So uh, this is a two vector, that's a different two vector. There's n components here where n is the number of external particles. So if I think, if I plot in an n-dimensional space where n is the number of particles, uh, uh, the first and the second components here, for a equals one and a equals two, each one of them would be some n vector in this n-dimensional space. The other one is two other n vectors in this n-dimensional space. 
But remember that Lorentz transformations act as SL2 on this guy and SL2 on that guy. So the invariant information is about the plane, the two plane which is spanned by lambda and the two plane that's spanned by lambda tilde. So already there's something a little interesting. There's, there's two little Grassmannians <laughs> that, are, that are making an appearance here, just in the data. Okay? There's a two plane for lambda and a two plane for lambda tilde. And momentum conservation is a statement that these two planes are orthogonal to each other. Okay? The sum of lambda a, lambda tilde a is equal to zero. Now, what we're going to do is uh, try to interpret that momentum conservation in a different way. By the way, I mean, uh, you might be surprised that there's going to be any mileage thinking about something as basic as momentum conservation. But remember that momentum conservation is so obvious in our usual way of thinking about things because the inside of the space-time that the momentum is, is the uh, conjugate variable to is obvious, is manifest in the usual way we talk about things. The whole point here is to, use, is to not have the inside of the space-time, so it stands to reason that momentum conservation might be interesting. And in, indeed, it, it, is, it is interesting. Okay, okay so, uh, so what we want to do is, is interpret this quadratic constraint that says lambda and lambda tilde are orthogonal as a pair of linear constraints by introducing a, a third object into the game. So we're going to introduce a general k-plane so here's the two-plane lambda, the, the two-plane lambda tilde, and we're going to demand that, that, that this k-plane C contains lambda and is orthogonal to lambda tilde. Okay? So if we say that, that's clearly going to force that lambda and lambda tilde are orthogonal to each other. And notice that this is, in fact, the parity invariant statement. A lambda flips lambda tilde. If I flip lambda and lambda tilde, but I also flip the k-plane and it's paired n minus k-plane, these are exactly the same statement. So, uh, so, so everything, I'm not breaking parity by this statement. Note also that if k equals 0 or 1, there is no, there is no point or line that contains this two-plane. So this is impossible. Similarly for n minus 1 and n. OK, that's good, because we're going to associate k with the k of the amplitude m n k, which, if you remember way back when, vanished when k equals 0, 1, n minus 1, or n. Okay. Okay. All right. So. Uh, so I will just represent uh, a k-plane in n dimensions by just giving the k by n matrix that, uh, that normally goes with it, um, just by giving the span of k uh, n-dimensional vectors. Whatever I do with this matrix better be invariant under GLK if it's going to be a statement about the k-plane. And so we're talking about uh, an element of the Grassmannian, as you know very well. All right. So um, now if I just try to say this picture in uh, equations, uh, let me do it. I'm going to write down a delta function that forces C to be orthogonal to lambda tilde, which I didn't draw, sorry. I, I'm also, uh, this is just enforcing that C contains lambda, simply by integrating over all possible linear combinations I can take of the vectors in, of the k vectors in, in, in C to, to match the, uh, to match the uh, lambdas. Okay? So this is just uh, demanding that there exists some linear combination of the C's that equals the two lambda vectors. Okay? Very good. So that's saying it. That's saying this picture in uh, equations, and everything is almost perfect except for the fact that because of these delta functions, this thing is actually not invariant under GLK. It's invariant under SLK, but not under GLK, just because rescaling everything by a constant, uh, I just pick up some Jacobians from these uh, delta functions. So this is where supersymmetry helps. All you do to repair this problem is at this point you add four fermionic variables with the same delta function whose Jacobian cancels this one. Famously, the Jacobians in, in supersymmetry have the opposite, uh, uh, are, are, are opposite to the uh, bosonic Jacobians. But here it's just motivated by preserving this picture about planes, by preserving GLK. The simplest way I can do that is by adding these uh, fermionic variables to make it all GLK. All right, so that's now all the sort of kinematics of this way of thinking about, uh, of, of uh, enforcing uh, momentum conservation by adding this auxiliary object. It looks maybe a little bit complicated, but if you go to twister space, you discover that it's something very, very simple. In twister space, that picture was just a statement that C is orthogonal uh, to the four plane, the super four plane in uh, twister space. Okay? And so that tells us that just kinematically, what we're dealing with is super conformal invariant, because it's, uh, it's just manifestly invariant under SL4 slash 4. Uh, linear transformations on the uh, Ws. Um, and in fact, that what, what we're dealing with are, if I, if I wanted to interpret as amplitudes, has something to do with gluons and all of their superpartners. Okay. All right. Now, 
and for general k, we have to integrate over all k planes. Okay? There isn't the unique one. We've got to integrate over all k planes. And this is really where the, the magic happens. Because uh, so far, I mean, uh, that there's, there's nothing new about, about uh, 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 that there's nothing fancy we're doing with the Grassmannians here at all. Um, but this is where something in interesting happens. Because when we integrate over all, uh, all k planes in n dimensions, we've got to choose a measure for the integration. And we choose a measure here. So, so to, uh, to, to make a measure, I need to uh, uh, have n uh, of the k by k minors downstairs. I'm imagining integrating over all these, uh, all these k by n matrices modulo glk. For this whole thing to be glk invariant, I need to have uh, net n minors uh, sitting downstairs. And the choice I make here is for the measure to be this product of cyclic minors. The first k by k minors, the second k by k, the third k by k, all the way around to the last one. Okay. It's that choice that makes uh, that it's right. So that's 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 where something that's where something remarkable happens is with that choice of the measure. But you see, having the cyclic structure. While it may, not, it may not be such an obviously interesting thing to do from the point of view of thinking about Grassmannians, is an interesting thing to do from the point of view of thinking about uh, scattering amplitudes and yang mills theories that have this natural cyclic structure. And I think this is one of the interesting points. As far as I know, at least in talking to, uh, uh, in talking to the mathematicians that I know, thinking about these kinds of cyclic structures in the Grassmannian is not such a common thing. And this is where all the magic is happening. The cyclic structure is where all the magic is happening here. Yes, yes. Yeah, so uh, uh, we're really going to think about this as a contour integral immediately. Okay? So it's just we're only going to talk about residues of this guy. Okay? And in fact, even these delta functions are really just a bunch of poles. So, uh, okay, but so, th so this, is, this is what we have then. We have an integral with the sort of simplest measure, and the dependence on the external data is the sort of simplest possible dependence. Right? And the remarkable fact is that this object seems to know about scattering amplitudes in n equals 4 super yang mills, not just at tree level, but at all loop level. Okay. This, simple, this simple contour integral seems to know something about scattering amplitudes in n equals 4 super yang mills to all loop order. Now, what could it know about? Remember, I told you that the, uh, that the general object that we're talking about at loop level is this integrand. The integrand depends on the external data as well as loop momenta. Right? Here, here, everything only depends on the external variables. There's no loop momenta. So what could it possibly be? What could you do with the integrand? If I handed it to you, not as a physicist, but as a mathematician, I handed you this rational function, uh, which is now the loop integrand. What could you do with it that would return uh, things that only depend on the external variables? You just compute residues of it. If you just compute multidimensional residues of this loop integrand, you get a whole suite of objects. Right? If you compute it one loop, two loops, three loops, uh, there's a whole suite of objects, which are residues of the loop integrand. The claim is that the residues of the loop integrand of quantum field theory are in one-to-one -one correspondence with the residues of this contour integral over the Grassmannian. So that's 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 the first claim. So in fact, uh, and this is a, a so so uh, if you if you wanted to compute the residues from quantum field theory, you would draw exactly the same Feynman diagrams you always draw. You'd sum all of them up, and all you do instead of using a normal propagator that would allow this particle to be virtual is you replace it with a delta function that forces it to be on shell. Okay? But it's exactly the same diagrams, exactly the same combinatorics, everything is exactly the same. You're just freezing all of the internal momenta by solving these algebraic equations that force all these guys to be, uh, to be on shell. Okay? So on the one hand, from quantum field theory, you have a whole list of algebraic functions, which you get from, uh, from computing residues of the loop integrand. List one. List two is all the residues of this contour integral of the Grassmannian. And the claim is these lists are identical, and that by now we can prove this, and we know precisely how to, how, which residue in the Grassmannian each one of these pictures cor corresponds to. Okay? And in fact, there's lots of things about this list produced by quantum field theory which are mysterious. For example, if you take the amplitudes with k equals 2, the simplest uh, amplitudes, you can still draw very complicated hundred loop diagrams, right? And you'd, you would still, you would, you would think that you get infinitely large lists of, uh, of uh, objects. And yet, 
all you ever get, uh, uh, the algebraic function that you get by computing this for MHV amplitude is always simply the MHV tree amplitude. Nothing new. You don't get any new objects at all. Okay? That fact has a very simple interpretation in the uh, Grassmannian. There's only one <laughs> residue we ever get. Okay? There's only one object we get in that case. There are other things. Remember, we saw some of these, uh, uh, um, all tree amplitudes turn out to be in interpretable like this. Remember, we saw some of these remarkable identities, the six term identity, <laughs> Uh, that I mentioned, uh, all the higher identities and so on. Those identities must be true for things like locality and unitarity uh, uh, to be true. Those identities are mapped simply into the relationships between these residues given by the global residue theorem. Okay? So it's really contour deformation in the Grassmannian, uh, which gives you all the relations you need uh, for the objects to have a local and unitary interpretation. So I'm mentioning this because it's an incredibly clean statement, and we've even proven it. Okay, but 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 uh, but there would be I think something there's something extremely interesting about uh, about how the uh, about how quantum field theory combinatorics on the one hand is mapped to this very very simple uh, contour integral on the other hand, which is I think worthy of further exploration. Now, I'm sorry I'm going a little over time. I won't be much much longer. Now this is the sort of real point of this uh, object, of this of this contour integral which is that it makes the dual conformal, the, this dual superconformal symmetry manifest. Okay? Uh, in fact, if we go back to this, to this picture where I forced uh, C to contain lambda and be orthogonal to lambda tilde, uh, just looking at it, uh, it's clearly very natural to say that, that this is really stupid. You're, you're integrating over all the planes, but you're forcing two of the directions to be contained in lambda. Why not just integrate over k minus two planes? Uh, which, uh, which are in the directions transverse to both lambda and lambda tilde. It's a very natural geometric thing to want to do. But remember, we have a measure of integration which depends on the minors of this k by k matrix. So it's not obvious, it's not obvious that, that you can inherit a proper measure on gk minus 2 from the measure that you started with on gki. However, it turns out that with this choice of cyclic minors, uh, Trivially, basically trivially, uh, you get a measure on gk minus 2 from the one that you started with, with gkn. And only with that choice of cyclic minors for the uh, denominator. And in fact, the formula that you get is exactly the same one, precisely the same formula. Uh, p is now k minus 2. Okay, so, I, so I did what I said, k goes to k minus 2. The formula is exactly the same, but you have to do some little linear transformations in the middle that, uh, that if you didn't know about them before, would invent momentum twister for. Uh, momentum twisters for you. Uh, I I if you recall, there was a simple linear transformation that mapped you from the usual lambda and lambda tilde variables to the momentum twister variables, and that's exactly the one that shows up here. So what you see from here is it's, it's exactly the same structure, but not in, not in twister space, but in momentum twister space. And that means that it's got the second conformal invariance. Okay? So this makes the dual superconformal symmetry manifest. And so that's how we see that this uh, this object is making all the symmetries of the theory manifest. Okay? In fact, uh, what, what, what was proven around seven or eight months ago is that if you just begin with superconformal invariance alone, and the, the non-trivial part turns out to be the super part, but if you just attempt to write down any super conformal invariant, any super conformal invariant is an integral over, over a Grassmannian with some measure. Okay? So that's, that's why sort of mathematically Grassmannians are making an appearance is that any superconformal invariant is an integral over the Grassmannian with some measure. Only with this measure do you also have invariance under the full Yagian algebra, which you can check. I mean, I, I showed you a geometric way of thinking about it, but you can also check it mechanically, acting the symmetry generators. Okay? So this is really the unique object, which is the answer to the question, write down all invariants of the SL4 slash 4 or SLM slash M in general Yangian algebra. You see it's written as a contour integral, and furthermore, there's lots of relations between these objects that are guaranteed by the global residue theorem that, that, that tell you uh, important things about how they're, uh, which are related to important physical properties like locality and unitarity. All right, All right. so let me just tell you one last thing, and I want to show you some of the uh, juice, uh, some of the actual results, and then I will, I, will, I will end. So that was a story, not for the, usual, not for the loop integrand, but the residues of the loop integrand. Let's say you want the loop, you want the loop integrand itself. So now you really want the, 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 actual, the actual object. All right. Uh, these turn out to be very simply related uh, to, uh, to basic 
operations that you can do on these Yangon invariants that, that, uh, that makes new ones out of old ones. So just starting from this, uh, just starting from this contour integral, uh, fr from this cross minor integral, it's very easy to see that if you take two invariants, you can fuse them to make a new one. You can remove a particle to, uh, uh, to, to reduce the number of particles by one. You can remove it by integrating over it. You can remove it by merging it with one of its neighbors. You can add a particle, uh, and so on. There are these just simple tinker toy operations to make new invariants out of old ones. For example, the two ways of taking BCFW, the, the, the two ways, uh, the way of taking two objects and jam them together to make a third one that, that gives you the BCFW tree amplitude is just a simple combination of these basic, uh, of these basic moves. And there's a simple picture for what, for what loops are. So if you imagine that the, if you imagine just qualitatively that the basic object has an infinite number of particles, why should we talk about any fixed finite number? It's probably natural to talk about the amplitude of an infinite number of particles. You might want to remove one particle at a time to go down to talk about the amplitude for a fixed number of particles. And if you do that by removing one at a time, just by integrating over one particle, then another, then another, then another, nothing new or, or interesting happens. But there's, a, there's an essentially unique second thing that you can do that generates a new object, which is when you, when you remove this particle and, then the, and, and the one next to it, um, you choose a, a, a contour of integration that's more entangled. You don't integrate one guy out on, some, on, one, on one set of, uh, on one torus and the other one on another torus. If you pick these two guys, they define a line in momentum twister space. You first integrate over the position of A and B on that line. After you're done, you integrate over all the lines. And that's really the only other kind of integral uh, you can do. You can't do something uh, fancier, like if you have three particles, they determine a plane. And the, well, the plane is just dual to a point again, so it's not, it's not, it's not interesting. The only, the only really new thing that you get is when you entangle, in this way, pairs of particles that you are removing. And so doing that uh, uh, takes you from, from, a, from, from a bigger object uh, to a lower one, which has uh, an interpretation as being uh, a piece of the loop integrand. And so uh, putting all these things together, we could derive from field theory a generalization of these recursion relations that computed tree amplitudes to then compute the all loop integrand. And it has exactly, uh, it, it has a very familiar uh, looking structure from many, many other contexts. Uh, pictures like this come up all over the place in, 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 in physics. Uh, but anyway, but, the, 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 but here it is. The, this is the, uh, if, it's a function of n, k, and l. l is the number of loops. It has one piece, which is just jamming lower points together, uh, a la uh, BCFW, what we saw already. And it has another piece, which is the inhomogeneous term, which gives you the quantum corrections, okay? which is just removing in this entangled way pairs of particles from, uh, from uh, amplitudes with fewer numbers of loops. So in, in a quite literal sense, this is a classical piece. That is a quantum piece. Okay. But this is it now. This, this is a formula you can, uh, it's, it's, it's a formula you can hand to Mathematica. You don't have to draw diagrams. You don't have to, uh, you don't have to think. You press return and you have the, you have the integrand. You have the integrand for uh, two loops, 17 particles, without uh, just, if, if, if you like. So it's a complete definition of the theory. It's a complete definition to all orders of perturbation theory. And it makes this Yangian symmetry manifest. Term by term, everything has been gotten together by, by, by uh, these elementary operations on the objects uh, that we uh, talked about associated from the contour integral. And as advertised in the beginning, the words space-time, Lagrangian, path integral, gate symmetry, et cetera, simply don't, don't appear. Okay, those aren't the relevant concepts. Okay. Um, well, let me just say this. Let me, let me say this. Uh, so, so there's a conformal symmetry in the space time. There's a conformal symmetry. Uh, there's this dual conformal symmetry in this dual space time. The object that we're talking about has a name in the original space time. It's the scattering amplitude. You might ask, what is its name in the dual space time? And this is something that, uh, that, that, uh, uh, that, that Juan here, and together with some of his, some of his friends a number of years ago, um, uh, propose that, that you should think about amplitudes as associated with a certain Wilson loop expectation value in this dual, dual space time. So if you imagine drawing this polygon and really thinking about it as, uh, as and, and computing 
the, uh, the expectation value of the operator, which is trace e to the i a dot this path going, going around in this new space time, that that would compute uh, the uh, scattering amplitude. So there was this correspondence between scattering amplitudes in space times and Wilson loop expectation values in the dual space time. And it was an open problem for uh, ever since, ever since their proposal in 2007, it was an open problem how to, uh, how to say this very precisely for any amplitude, any helicities you want to talk about, and so on. Uh, and that problem was, was solved um, back, back in the fall um, by some of our uh, twistorial friends, as well as uh, Simone Karan Hua, who's one of, our, uh, one of our postdocs here. It's a beautiful solution. Uh, and so now there's perfect symmetry being established between both descriptions. They're called scattering amplitude in space time. They're called this supersymmetric Wilson loop in the dual space time. They compute exactly the same object. And in fact, the, the conjecture that they were, that they had been, uh, that they were equal has now been, been proven. Okay? I should say all the conjectures, all the things that I said were conjectures so far have now, now, now actually have a proof. All right, but let me, let me end just by showing you uh, what it's good for and, and the kind of problems that, 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 that I hope that we can have more fertile interactions with uh, uh, mathematicians about. So, so I told you we have this formulation of the theory that, that doesn't, uh, we have, well, we have this in principle complete formulation of the theory. So we should be able to compute things like, uh, like two loop amplitudes. Turns out the pro one loop problem is, is so simple that it can be solved in lots and lots of different ways. Uh, but, uh, but two loops already starts becoming interesting. So uh, this is the result for calculating two loop MHV amplitudes. These are the simplest amplitudes with k equals two at two loops. And um, this is the result of a, of a computation done about a year ago, a little, a little over a year ago, using the standard methods. The standard methods are not Feynman diagrams remotely. Feynman diagrams are utterly, completely hopeless. Okay? But this is using still the, the, the sort of the, the state of the art technology to do these computations. Okay? So each one of these is a certain kind of uh, topology associated with a certain sort of uh, integral over the regions in X space. Um, and each one of those things is some coefficient that you have to weight each one of these things with. Okay? You see, this is not a thing of, uh, it doesn't scream out that the answer is simple. And there's seven more pages of this. Okay? So that was the state of the art as of about a year ago. This is the state of the art as of December. Uh, because we know the answer. We have the, uh, using this recursion, we know the answer, so we can actually just, just look at it. So all two-loop MHV amplitudes, the eight pages I showed you before, are that top line. Just a single object. Uh, now, I have to tell you what, what these wiggly lines mean and so on. <laughs> Um, but but, uh, but uh, the important point is that, that it's actually naturally written as an integral over lines in momentum twister space. And these wiggly lines just denote certain natural numerator factors that, 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 that you would write that make the answer conformally invariant. And uh, uh, I mean, I could write it explicitly. But it's just some integral that's written in a natural way as, as integral over lines in momentum twister space. In fact, two lines. One for that region and one for that region. It's an eight-dimensional eight integral. Than I, I'm sorry. Yes, the i less than i means that this that, that these indices are cyclically ordered. Okay, so uh, so it does say i i less than i, and there's always some wise guy in the audience who makes that remark. So thank you. <laughs> okay, <laughs> yes. All right. So um uh, now uh, so why was the other result so so complicated? It's because um. Uh, it's because while these integrals look extremely natural when written in momentum twister space, they look like more complicated integrals if you were to write them in the usual variables. So, so normally people try to reduce the integrals to look as simple as possible. This notion of simplicity wasn't very invariant. It just looked simpler. Um, and that comes at a, a too, at a too heavy cost. Okay? It really wants to be written as a single beautiful object in momentum twister space. And you then won't be surprised. You know, none of these things had ever been computed until actually last summer. Uh, a, a few cases were, were computed for the next MHV guys. But this is all of them. It's just two, two terms like that. This is all three loop amplitudes. Okay? And I think th these would have been uh, general thought, I think, completely hopeless. Um, but, but not only is it not hopeless, there is some clear, very beautiful structure which is, which is emerging from this recursive answer. You see, it's so beautiful that it makes you think there's a, some way of getting these answers directly without having to go through this recursion. Uh, and as, as we all know, whenever you have a recursion relation, it's the answer to some question. It's nice to know what the question is. 
Okay? Uh, it's like we, we have the answer, but we don't know what, what, what question uh, that recursion relation is a natural answer to. Okay? So let me give you uh, another uh, indication of some uh, dramatic simplicity at work. Uh, so what I was telling you about was just about the integrand. You might want to carry out the final step and compute the integral. Really compute the integral. Okay? Now, uh, yeah. This is an integral, right, that's right. So everything so far was completely holomorphic, totally holomorphic. And now we're going to do an integral over, over, the, over, real, over the lines that correspond to real points in, uh, in uh, Minkowski space, what uh, Twister people would call PN. So you, 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 would, you would integrate over, over the real section. Right. OK, so um, now, uh, so this is, uh, this, this is a two-loop uh, for some quantity called the remainder function, you don't need to know what it is. Um, but it turns out that it's first non-trivial for six external particles and two loops. And um, this was the result of a heroic computation done by some Russians around nine months ago, I guess. What is G? Uh, I'll tell you what G is in a second. So, um, so uh, uh, something, that, something general you should know about uh, uh, what happens when you fully carry out the integrals is that the integrals are polylogarithms. At one loop, they're dialogues. At two loops, there are four logs and so on. Okay? And so uh, the G is, uh, uh, as many of you know better uh, than I do, there's no very canonical theory of polylogarithms beyond trilogs. Uh, but these Gs are Goncharov polylogs uh, uh, that, that start, uh, well, w which, which do give a basis for all uh, transcendentality for uh, objects that, that you might like. Okay? So it's this plus 16 more pages like this was the answer. Now, um, our friends uh, uh, Mark Spladen and Nastya Volovich, uh, who were at, at Brown, um, uh, went to Sasha Goncharov, uh, who was at Brown th uh, at the time, um, and they asked him if there was any way the answer could possibly be so complicated. I mean, polylogs satisfy crazy identities, so could it possibly be there's some crazy identity that makes this very, very simple? Okay. And using ideas that, uh, that, 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 that Sasha has developed building on on uh, many, many older ideas, they did indeed simplify it to that single line. Okay? And this makes use of the, this, 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 this makes use of motivic Galois theory, uh, something I would love to learn more about um, if anyone would explain what some of the words meant. Um, but uh, anyway, but whatever it is, it's not BS uh, because <laughs> it manages to uh, simplify 20 pages of. Uh, of these horrible polylogs of this single line. Okay? Now, this is what happens. The previous 20 pages are what happens when you do the standard Feynman diagrams and you evaluate them in the standard way. Okay? You get those 20 pages. The fact that using these tricks, they, were, they managed to see that it was a simple, I mean, if they didn't know the answer, they wouldn't be able to do this. They just took the answer and managed to, uh, managed to, to extract this invariant content to see that they, they could reduce it to that. Okay? But this is, this is telling us that we should expect some incredible simplicity at the level even of the final answer. We've seen it at the level of the integrand, even at the level of the final answer. We should expect some, some, some remarkable simplicity. And in fact, there are some hints for something like that already. So we don't have, we're not writing the answer in the usual way. We have these new kinds of integrals, and it's quite likely that these new kinds of integrals directly have nice answers and correspond directly to nice polylogarithms. Not pages and pages of them, but each one of them is directly corresponding to some polylog. That's a one calculation from last fall, for, uh, for again showing in some cases that each that these guys do seem to be something very very nice uh, individually, all all by all by by themselves. And so it's very likely, and this is something we're working on very hard right now, that these pictures are really associated with some geometric story. And if we uh, just understand the geometric story, we'll write down the answer more or less by inspection, without having to, uh, without having to uh, touch any integrals. But that's also some place where, now, Grassmannians have made an appearance, polylogs have made an appearance. I don't need to tell many people in this audience who know much more than I do. That these words occurred together uh, a number of, uh, in many other uh, instances in the past 20 years. Uh, and so um, uh, one really hopes that uh, there's a more concrete connection. But let me just finish by saying that, that even going back to the integrand, it seems like uh, we, we're still not completely happy. As I mentioned, we have this recursive definition for what it is. 
but it's clear that uh, that's just, it's clear that that's the answer to some question and we don't know what the question is. And another thing which seems to be emerging is that uh, it, what the question is it looks like um, it's first metaphorically and in some cases precisely, the amplitude should be thought of as the volume of some polytopes in some, in some space. So if the amplitude was the area of that little trapezoid, we could triangulate that in different ways, like that triangle minus that triangle, or that triangle minus that triangle, or that triangle plus that triangle. And different triangulations make different physical properties manifest. Some triangulations uh, correspond to BCFW, some triangulations make the Yangian manifest, other triangulations make locality manifest, some triangulation makes unitarity manifest. But you have one basic geometric object, and the different triangulations make different physical properties manifest. As I said, this is a metaphor, and in some cases we understand it really precisely. Uh, oh, but, I, but Sorry, yes. What space does that like? So in, uh, we, we don't know in general what, 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 what the answer is, uh, but, but it's in, it, it, so, uh, I mean, they're all some kind of projective space, some sort of Grassmannian, but, but, but we don't know the uh, general story. Okay? Um, but I just want to say that, that this recursive, uh, this recursive definition should be thought of as providing one class of triangulations, again, without telling you what it is that you've triangulated. Just handing you all these little bits and pieces and saying that's the answer, without telling you that they really uh, add up to that green, green trapezoid. Okay? Some cases we understand this very precisely. So for, for, next to, for, for the simplest case of non-trivial tree amplitudes, they are literally the volume in some CP4 which is naturally associated with momentum twister space. There's a small extension of momentum twister space into CP4. There's a very natural set of polytopes, again, with this nice cyclic structure inherited from the underlying cyclic structure of the amplitudes, and it's literally the volume of that polytope. You, so so you, you start with a, with, a, with a tetrahedron, you chop, off, uh, you, chop off, uh, you chop off a corner to get this shape, you keep chopping off the same corner over and over again, you get this interesting kind of a polytope. And the volume of that polytope is the, is the amplitude, is the tree amplitude. And different ways of triangulating it, uh, some of them give you the BCFW form, and other ones, uh, uh, other, there, there's even more obvious triangulations that give you new forms for the answer that hadn't been written down before, but which are manifestly local. So again, it, it's an example where one triangulation makes, uh, roughly, speaking, roughly speaking, unitarity manifest, this sort of factorization properties that go into BCFW. The other makes locality manifest, and they're not manifest at the same time. They're made manifest by different triangulations. And uh, we, have, we have another example of where we understand this more or less perfectly. For the, simplest for the simplest case of one loop amplitudes, you can literally interpret them as the volume of some square, uh, some canonical square of this polygon. And once again, the, uh, the sort of internal triangulation of each one of the polygons gives you a form that's manifestly local. This external triangulation gives you a form that's manifestly unitary. Um, but the thing itself is this, is this nice invariant geometric volume. It's that uh, completely invariant um, interpretation that we lack even for the integrand in general. So I'm very sorry to have gone so far over time. So I, let me just skip that. But let me just say that, that there, there seems to be some interesting structure uh, which, is, uh, which, is, which, is, uh, which is combining, uh, for this problem of the scattering amplitudes, uh, string theory ideas, integrability ideas, ideas from uh, twister theory, although, again, most of the tw twistorial things so far have been very kinematical, uh, but still, that they're, they're playing a, a huge role in the story. And there's a bunch of amazing new mathematical structures that, that whose role in life we don't understand. Um, but, uh, um, um, uh, but, we hope this picture will uh, clarify uh, soon. And if it's possible to get uh, some of the audience interested in, in looking into some of these things, that, 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 that would be wonderful. Thanks a lot.